All right, the book of Jonah. Uh, we're going to do a, a little mini-series in the book of Jonah over the next few weeks, uh, looking at the prodigal prophet. And I was really challenged by and have been challenged by this book and just the way that it plays itself out and uh, it impacts, it's, pre, it's very prevalent and important for today, especially in the health of the church, the health of missions, the health of evangelism, the gospel, uh, but even just in our lives practically as we go through. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the book or heard of the book called Adrift. Uh, it is uh, written by Stephen Callahan. Stephen Callahan was a sailor. Uh, just He is a nautical engineer. He created his own, built his own sailboat, sailed all over the Atlantic. Uh, but back in 1981, in the process of doing one of his trips, his, his boat sank. And in the process of that happening, he was able to recover some items and uh, was able to get his life raft. And he lived on his life raft for 76 days in the ocean. And while he was going through that, it talks, the, the book talks about the different things he did using solar covers to collect water and rain. And, uh, but one of the most unique things that he did was he took three pencils that he had and created a sextant that he was able to use then to uh, determine where he generally was and get himself in a proper road, would row himself to a certain area to get into the current that eventually drifted him into the Caribbean. So I guess he just ended up on vacation, a long vacation down in the Caribbean. But uh, he ended up doing that and was able to do that. And he said the reason that he was able to use the pencils was because of the constant of the stars in the sun. And then because they are constant, he said no matter how changing his situation was, he was able to navigate and allowed himself to be rescued after that time. When we go through the book of Jonah, it is, a, it is an issue of life and death. He faced that life and death situation, and Jonah is, is replete with the idea of life and death. Jonah is told to go. He, we know he rebels. He ends up facing a storm, and that storm is a situation of life and death. He's swallowed by a great fish, situation of life and death. He's at odds with the Almighty God, a situation of life and death. He tells the Ninevites, if you don't repent, there's going to be death. There's a situation of life and death. And even the plant at the end of the book, the, you see these aspects of life and death. You see the, 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 the importance, the urgency in this book. And Jonah is going to look, and Jonah, the book of Jonah is going to help us to navigate our life here. And we want to look for those constants, just like Stephen Callahan, look for constants in, in the stars, in the sky. We want to look for some constant principles and truths through the book of Jonah that tell us, okay, this is how we need to navigate life, to live in this life in order to understand how we, how we live. Now, it says, the book, the book of Jonah starts off right away. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying. So, Jonah, have you ever, have you ever wondered when you read this book, does God just like randomly pick up this guy out of nowhere and say, okay, let's, let's take Jonah and let's just, he's the, he's the new prophet on the block and let's, let's use him. Well, it's not the case. In fact, if you just stick your bookmark in there, we've been having this interesting conversation with some of the young adults. The Bibles with two of these bookmarks is really nice because you can go back and forth. But we're going to go to another passage. Let's go to 2 Kings 14. Leave a finger in Jonah, but let's go back over to 2 Kings chapter 14. In 2 Kings chapter 14, we get a little bit of the historical background of this prophet named Jonah. It talks about in, in verse 25 of uh, 2 Kings 14, it says, He restored the coast of Israel from entering Hamath unto the sea plains. It's talking about Jeroboam uh, the second, who's the king of Israel, the northern tribes at this point. According to the word of the Lord, God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, uh, which was of gath Hefer. So we, we get a little bit of a background here. Jonah was a prophet in Israel, in the northern kingdoms under Jeroboam II. He was a successful prophet. Now, successful doesn't mean like he made lots of money. It means that when he prophesied, his prophecies came true. So at the hand of the Lord here, he's told King Jeroboam that your, your kingdom is going to expand. And it did come to pass. So Jonah was a successful prophet already. He's enjoyed a ministry of success. He's enjoyed years of prophesying and working with the king on behalf of the Lord to do this. He lived in a region of Galilee is where he, he was. And I think it's important for us to note, Jeroboam's successes were not because of Israel's obedience. It was because of God's compassion. In fact, it says that as it goes on, for the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter. 
For there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper of Israel. And the Lord said, not that he would blot the name of Israel out from under, um, under the heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. So this wasn't because Jeroboam was this great, great godly king. In fact, it, it says that he was not a godly king. But it was God's compassion that helped Israel at that point. So all of that to say, Jonah was a real and successful prophet. He was a historical character. You might say, well, why, why is that important? Because when we come to the book of Jonah, is it fact or is it fiction? Now, our, our quick Bible answer, or, you know, the good Sunday school, yes, it's real, it's real. But the book of Jonah comes under attack very often for the fact of, is it really historical? Is it just this myth, this legend that's made up? You know, even in our, even in our it's, it's sort of become like a, it, the coloring pages, you know, where the, where the pirates, where the pirates who don't do anything really, what it was talking about with the mariners on the, the thing with veggie tails, there's, there's more to it than just the cute, cutesy, little coloring book type story. This is a real historical, in fact, we know as we just saw from 2 Kings 14, Jonah was a real and successful prophet. Nothing in the book of Jonah tells us or even gives us indication that we should treat it as anything but historical. In fact, the opening of Jonah is a historical marker in, literary, in the literary world, saying this Jonah, the son of Amittai. It's giving you historical reference to who this individual was. Josephus, a Jewish historian more toward the New Testament time, refers to Jonah as a historical account in his antiquities. But I think the most important dynamic is Jesus Christ himself recognized Jonah's experience as factual, as historical. And so if Christ does, we, we need to recognize Jonah as a real tale, not as a tale of a tale like we see it, but a real historical account. It happened. And you may look and go, well, I just don't see how this could happen. It happened. God is involved in a miraculous way in this, in this story. So when we go to the book of Jonah, I don't want us to go, and, and I'm fearful, that we go with the illusion of knowledge. Are you familiar with this? The illusion of knowledge is that we would rather act like we know something than admit that maybe we don't know something. For example, do you know how your car really works? I mean, there are probably a few people in here who could, who could explain how your car really works, but most of us, we know our car works by doing this, putting, you know, shifting, and that's it. And we just hope that it, we don't really know how it works, but we act like we know it works. Let me, let me give you a little simpler illustration. I'd like you to do something. Take 30 seconds, and on a blank part of your notes there, draw a bicycle. And draw a bicycle that will work. Okay, go ahead. Just real quick. Not a unicycle, it's gotta have two wheels. Yes, one in the front and one in the back. Very good, Barb. <laughs> one of the shows that I like to watch is called Brain Games. And it's by National Geographic, and it's, it's on like how our brain works and all. And they did this test, and then they took the, the designs that people drew and actually turned them into bicycles and then told them to try and ride it. And they said, basically, you, they, they have four general types of bicycles that end up coming, coming together on it. And if you look at these bikes, maybe your bike looks like one of them. The only one that will potentially work is the first one on the top left. The other one, the, the one on the top right, you can't steer it any, any which way because the way the, the front would be. The back, the bottom left one, you would steer with your seat. So could you imagine, like, you're riding and you're trying to do this while you're... While you're it, it doesn't work. And the other one has no, no pedals whatsoever to, to ride. I'm fearful that when we come to the book of Jonah, we will come with the illusion of knowledge. Because oftentimes, biblical accounts that have become Sunday school stories, we develop an illusion of knowledge. But if you really think about the story of Jonah, many times when we tell the story of Jonah, when we recount the story of Jonah, we leave out the entire chapter two. We barely deal with chapter 4. We only deal with a couple verses in chapter 3. We deal with a third of the story of the book of Jonah when we tell the story of Jonah. So I don't want us to just go and check out, all right, I know Jonah. Let's not go with the illusion of knowledge, but let's go 
to the scriptures and say, what does this book teach us? And we see right away that there is a running of resp from responsibility. Jonah right away is given a command by God. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come upon me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We see the book begin in a very exciting way. God has self-disclosed himself. He's saying, here I am, and Jonah, I want you to go do something for me. I want you to rise up. I want you to go. There's this sense of immediacy, like this needs to happen, and it needs to happen now. It's a definite and firm calling from the Lord to Jonah, saying, I want you to go, and I want you to do this. Jonah understood that. I think it's very important for us to understand from the outset that Jonah knew that God wanted him to go. It wasn't unclear. It wasn't like, a, eh, maybe. This was a, you need to go. And you know, even for us today, God is still calling people. God is still prompting people, causing desires in people's heart to go, to serve, to share the gospel. Even for us as a whole, as people, as Christians, we are, we are called to disciple. We are called to share the gospel. God does this because he cares about people. Why is he sending Jonah to Nineveh? Because he cares about Nineveh. That might be hard for Jonah to wrap his head around, but God cares about people, and so God calls, God prompts us to, to be going. God calls his people to share the love, the hope, the grace of Jesus Christ in this day and age. We are, as believers, expected by God to go out and to share. We are told to do that. Now he's told to go. Where is he told to go to? To Nineveh, that great city, to cry against it. Nineveh is this city that was about seven miles across. It was a large city for that time. And as it was there, it's, a, it's about 400 miles northeast of Israel uh, from, where, from where Jonah would have been in the Galilee region. And it was, it's the idea here where it talks about um, that he says, for their wickedness has come up before me. The idea is it smells to high heaven. This city stinks. This city is rank with wickedness, and I want you to go there. Now notice, it's not the Jonah that notices and has this. God says this. God says that he's the one who's noticing. God is the one who is active. God is the one who took this in seriously. God recognized, God saw the wickedness of, of Nineveh. God was moved by it, and God wanted something done about it. And so God prompts Jonah to, to go. Now, if you look at the historical nature of this city, it makes sense as to why their wickedness was considered so rank. They were known for their violence. In fact, Assyria's brutality, they were known for the severing of heads, the bringing you before the king and then cutting off your lips because he felt you lied or you didn't tell the truth, so they would cut your lips off or sever the hands of an individual. There, there's accounts of them flaying, skinning people alive. Some accounts of them leaving people out in the in the desert, bound to be eaten by the, the wild animals and to bake in the sun. I don't know about you, but that does not seem like the ministry I want. If that's how y'all treated me, I'd probably be looking and saying, Chicago looks greater. Okay, and, and I do not want to go back there. Okay, and, and so we look at it and we say, okay, it's, it's a pretty nasty place. They were known for their uh, brutality, and they were enemies of so many nations, including Israel. In fact, jump ahead 60 years, and it's going to be Assyria that's going to take the northern kingdom into captivity. So we know that there is an animosity. There is, there is a dynamic here where Assyria and Israel are not the best of buds. Nobody in that area is like, ooh, I like Assyria. They, they were, a, they were a, a wicked place. However, at this point in time, Assyria had some weaknesses. They were fighting battles on many different fronts. In fact, they even had some infighting that was occurring, and there were some internal revolts. There was a famine that was occurring. Now, there were two major famines. Some of the historians believe that it lasted between the two dates that are given, but there are at least two major famines during this time. So as a nation, Assyria is actually a little bit weaker during this time, and God tells Jonah, hey, there's, there's a lot going on. They need to hear my gospel. They need to hear about me. I want you to go and tell them to, to repent. And so Jonah is called to go right into the bully's backyard and to preach against their ways. No other prophet was called to do this. You have Amos coming from the southern kingdom to go to the northern kingdom, but for the most part, you don't have uh, the, the prophets. The prophets went to Israel and to Judah. They didn't go out. Jonah's told, 
I want you to go right into the bully's backyard and I want you to knock him in the teeth. And you're not talking about just like one bully. I mean, this is, this is the big nation. This is the big cat on the planet and Jonah's just a little mouse and he's afraid if I go, something bad's gonna happen. So you can sort of see Jonah's reluctance to a degree. He travels, and it, and it could be because of the infamous violence. But at this point in the story, we're not told why. In fact, there's another reason that's going to be given later in the book, and we'll deal with it when we get there, but we won't deal with it now. That's my cliffhanger for future messages. But he looks and says, I don't want to go. He is told to arise and go, and what does he do? What does it say? He arose, and he fled. He goes the opposite way. Jonah runs in the opposite direction. He plans to flee to Tarshish, in verse number number three, via, via Joppa. He's going to go down to Joppa, and there, Tarshish is a Phoenician port in Spain. It's about 2,500 miles west of Israel. It's known for its silver. It's, it's not the, the, the journey there and the journey back, the Phoenicians would often go to Spain to get silver and to get pricey items to, to go. So when we talk about the, the cargo on the ship that they're going to get rid of, it's not simply cheap stuff. The, to go over there to trade for silver, you're going to have to bring some high-end items to there, in case you want to reference my idea. From Joppa, where he's at, it's about 550 miles to Nineveh. And Jonah's going to jump in a boat, and he's going to go 20, try and go 2,500 miles the other direction. It's pretty obviously obvious what Jonah is doing. He is getting out of Dodge. He's running. Okay, so the problem is, is Jonah's theology is too good. He knows he can't run from God. But he's running. It says here, what is he trying to do? to go with them to Tarshish, the end of verse 3, from the presence of the Lord. He's trying to, to run from God without, out of God's presence. But he knows, just like we read in the Psalms, anywhere you go, God is there. No matter where you run. And, he, and they had the Psalms at this point. They understood that God was everywhere. What Jonah's trying to do is he's trying to escape the stage, the area where God is working out his purposes, where God is going to work out his judgments. He's trying to, to not be involved in that. He's saying, I don't want part of that. I want to do my own thing. And so he's going to seek a culture where he's not going to hear about God's faithfulness. He's not going to hear about God's commands or anything else in relationship to God. He doesn't want to hear about Jehovah. He wants to be able to go somewhere to get out of the, out of the way so that he can just do his own thing so that he can focus on his own way rather than the way that, that God desires. Notice the determination that Jonah has here. It's not just like, eh, I think I'll try and, and go out. He's going to set sail. He goes down to Joppa. He's going to pay the fare, and then he's going to get in the boat, and he's going to go, go on it. He's going he's to put himself in a situation that is relatively dangerous, but he was so determined to get out that he just says, I'm, I'm going. And so he gets on the boat, he tries to flee from the presence of the Lord, and really, isn't he playing the fool? To pit, your, to pit the wealth and the, the work of a seafarer against the skills of the creator of the land and sea. He knows that's who God is. And yet he feels that he can run from the Almighty. And I don't think Jonah's the only one. I don't think that he's the only one who ever reads a command of God or ever hears something and figures, I can figure out a way to do it myself, not the way that God wants me to do it. And so as Jonah, as Jonah goes, he, he goes down to Joppa. Notice, notice the direction that his rebellion takes him. It takes him down to Joppa, down into the ship. Later on, it's going to come up again that he goes down into the sides of the ship. He's, he's as far way down as he can get. And that's, that's where it leads us. That's where it takes us. It takes us down. And I think as we look at one of those precepts of life, one of the things that we face is our tendency is to run from God's leadership in our life. I know that's mine. That is my natural, sinful tendency. Is when God leads, I like my autonomy. I like my direction, and so therefore I do what I want to do rather than submitting to the direction that God leads. And so Jonah pits the seafarers against God in this foolish action to, to, to come up. And so now we see this chaos that ensues. There's the chaos of the mariners. Notice in verse 4, 
But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. The shift in the story takes place here. We go from Jonah, but now there's going to be this focus for a while on these seafarers, these mariners that are there. And as they're on this boat, they don't know what they're in for. They're just figuring they're in for another day at the, at the, at the office. They're, they're going to go. They're going to get ready. And as they go, we see the storm that comes up. It's a direct result of God. This storm is not just this random thing that just popped up, but rather this storm, as we are told from a divine perspective, was directed at them from God. It's sent with a single purpose, to stop Jonah in his tracks, to say, you're wanting to do this, but I'm going to send this to stop you. And are there not times in life where we're going one way and God says something to just stop us right in our tracks? It happens. Notice, notice what happens. The word sent here, when it talks about, but the Lord sent out a great wind, is often used in the Hebrew scriptures for the hurling of a spear, the, the, the throwing of a spear. And that's what he's doing, is he's throwing this storm directly at them. He is hurling the storm there. It emphasizes that the Lord is acting against Jonah himself. Interesting, the word here that's used for the ship, I think, is very, very interesting. It's so that the ship was like to be broken. It has this idea that the ship itself was determined to break. Literally, it was, it's almost as if it had a will. Everything that's in this passage, the wind, the sea in verse 4, the ship, all of them are submitting to the will of God. God is saying, this is what you do, you follow, you follow, you follow. You get this sense of everything else around except for Jonah is submitting to the leadership of God. Everything else is saying, this is God, we submit, except for the one who should be doing it except for the one who should be submitting to the leadership of God. Jonah's decision to run has now become a life and death matter for these sailors. They're facing a critical moment. And as, that, as that, the waves come crashing in, as the storm arises, Jonah's decision to run, for those, it's, it's to the sailors and to the captain. I think it's a really important dynamic for us to remember this. It is not easy for us to resign from the Lord's work. Jonah's trying. He is desperately trying to resign from the Lord's work. And yet, God is saying, no, 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 I, I have plans for you. I want you to be doing something. You might be running, but I, I have plans for you. And so it's hard to resign. And our tendency may be to run from God and his leadership, but God's tendency is to pursue us even in our insanity. It is insane for Jonah to run and to get into a boat and to try and go away and run from God. It is completely insane what he puts everybody through. And yet he does it. And yet God compassionately pursues. You may be running. You may be rebelling against God. And yet God compassionately pursues. So I call him the prodigal prophet. Because it so reminds me of the prodigal son. Where the father is looking out longing for the son to return. The compassion that God shows to the son. That the father shows to the son. And that God shows to us. The compassion to say come back. The compassion to say submit to my leadership in your life. The compassion to say stop rebelling in whatever area it is. And just submit and follow me is a wonderful picture of what this storm is. We look at the storm and go, oh man, that's really bad. But it was really a compassionate action of God to say, Jonah, stop, I've got something in plan for you. I have something that you need to be doing. And I'm pursuing you. I'm not going to let you. I'm not, there are times that God gives us everything we want. And those are sometimes not really good. And there are times that God doesn't give us what we want. And this is one of those cases where God is giving to Jonah what he doesn't want. He's going to say, I'm stopping. You're, you're going to go. You're going to, you're going to go and return. And so the, the, the mariners now are still in, still in light here. And you're going to see a contrast that as this storm is ensuing around them, as their life is seemingly in, in the peril, it's at the point of life and death, they don't know what else to do. You're going to see a contrast between them and Jonah. You're going to see how they respond, how they act as compared to Jonah. 
The obvious results of the tempest are shown in these verses. What, what happens? The mariners, the seasoned veterans, the salty dogs, they're, they're there. They know how to, to navigate the waters. They are afraid. And what do, they, what do they do? They look and they say they're afraid, and they cried out every man to his God. Why did they do that? Because they recognize that this very well could be a divine storm. They're realizing that, that, God might, that, that a God might be involved at this point. So they're going to start praying to that. So they pray, and not only do they pray, but then they begin to lighten the load by casting their cargo overboard. Again, not, not inexpensive cargo. They're throwing their livelihood overboard in order to save their lives. And so they, they do this. It was not cheap. As I mentioned, Tarshish was a silver point. You find these men working feverishly in verse 5. To, to work hard, but they're also praying heartily. And I liked what one commentator said. He said, we should be praying like everything depends on prayer and working like everything depends on work. That when we, do the, when we do the work of the ministry, we're working like everything depends on that, but we are so bound up in prayer because everything depends upon prayer. And so these men are, these men are praying, they're working hard, and the storms, the frightening intensity is growing, the sailors are becoming more and more frantic, and Jonah is completely oblivious to the storm. Notice the contrast, verse five. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay fast asleep. Once again, he goes down. That's that third time we see that he is down in the, in the ship. So he's fast asleep. He's not praying. He's, he's doing nothing. He's not working to help lighten the load. He's, everything that the sailors are doing, Jonah is doing none of it. How could he sleep through such a severe storm? You ever wonder that? Interestingly, the word that's used for sleep is the same word that's used where God caused Adam to fall asleep to take a rib out. It's a deep, it's a deep sleep. Jonah was exhausted. He was, he was out. Could it be that he was exhausted because he was doing everything in his power to run away from God and to live his perfect life? To live, to do, he's, he's just so intense. He's getting out. He's so intent on running that he's now just completely exhausted. It could be. But he's going to get a wake-up call. He's going to get a wake-up call in verse 6 where it says, so the shipmaster or the captain came to him and said, the master of the sails is the idea here, uh, it said unto him, what meanest thou, O sleeper, arise? You, have we heard that word before? Where has he been told to arise before? Arise, go to Nineveh. He arose, he goes the other way, and now the captain looks and says, arise. I mean, you got to think he's got to, words Jonah's going to start hating. Arise is probably going to be one of them. And he, he, he says, Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. So he's, he's being asked why you're sleeping. The captain implores him to join, you know, the prayer meeting that's, that's taking place. And all around Jonah are people who wanted a solution. They wanted a, su a solution to escape this death. And Jonah is attempting to flee from the presence of the solution. All around us is, is people looking for the solution to death. And yet we flee sharing the solution of death with them. We own the solution. Many of us here possess the solution. We have Christ within us. And yet we look at the solution and we say, I'm not going to share it because I'm scared. I'm not going to share it because it's uncomfortable. I'm not going to share it because I don't have the time. And yet we are called to be sharing that solution. And yet, what do we do? How do we respond? I think sometimes we look at Jonah and we say, wow, he's such a bad prophet. And then I have to look at myself and go, wow, I'm such a bad Christian. Because there are many times I flee. I flee from the presence of what God desires for me to be doing. And Jonah's, Jonah's doing the same thing. And here's this pagan leader telling him, hey, get up, pray, do something. It's a sad commentary in our lives when those who are committed to the truth need to be prodded into spiritual service. I think that's a constant. That ought to be for us as a church a statement that reminds us that we shouldn't have to be prodded to do the truth, to follow through on the leadership of God. We need to look and say, this is what God calls us to, let's do it. Let's follow through on it. Now, the question comes from the mariners. 
they start to ask these questions. When they see Jonah, they, they find him. And look, look at what it says in verse 7. And they said everyone to his fellow, come, let us cast lots that we may know for, those, uh, for, for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fall upon Jonah. Now, lots, you might be thinking, like, what is it? Is it like a magic eight ball, you know? No. Maybe later. No, that's, that's not what the lots were. It wasn't like this, this little magic eight ball that's there. This was a, a, a common way for them to decide if uh, the, the, will, the will of God. In fact, they, they would look and they would cast the stones, uh, usually a, white, a stone with white and black on each side, and they would cast them if it's white and black, or if it's, uh, they would do it again until it came up white and white or black and black, and if you were the one, then it would tell who was guilty. Well, whatever, however it worked, we know that from a divine perspective, it fell upon Jonah. Jonah is the guilty culprit, and we know that, that that's what happened. So once they discover that Jonah's the culprit, what do they do? They just barrage him with questions. What, why is this happening to us? What's your occupation? Where are you from? What's your country? Who are your people? He, like, it's like, you can just picture Jonah. The, the ship is rocking. All these sailors are like, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? And everything's flying around them, as well as everything else being chaotic. He is in, the, he is in a very chaotic moment. And they're asking him all these questions. And I think when we look at the statement that, that's going to be given here, where he says, I am a Hebrew and I fear Jehovah, God of heaven, creator of the land and sea. This statement is further proof to the, the sailors that this is a divine storm. Because he looks and he says, this is the creator of the land and sea. And this is my God, and everything is pointing to me right now. And they're looking and saying, the law to fall upon him, he's the culprit, his God is the one of the land and sea. This storm is a divine storm, and it's this guy's fault. And so it obviously demonstrated God's power. And Jonah's testimony, what's interesting to me, is his testimony is not matching up with what he just said. He gives a small statement, a confession of faith here. He says that I am a follower of Jehovah God. And yet is he following Jehovah God? No. He's running from his life is not matching what he's claiming to be. And the mariners ask a follow-up question. Why have you done this? Okay, why, why have you done this to us? My translation is, are you crazy? It's, it's like they're looking like, why, what are you thinking? Why would you get on the ship and run from your God who's the creator of the land and the sea? And yet he does that. They're looking and saying, you're nuts. You are, you are absolutely bonkers. And they can't figure out why he's doing it. And they, the mariners had a better grasp of God at this point, really, than Jonah did. They, they understood that you run from your God. Now, I get it. I get that they don't have good theology at this point. But they still understood that, that to run from the divine was to bring about problems in your life. And Jonah's like, well, I'm just going to run. I'm just going to do it. It's no big deal. Remember, Jonah has been a successful prophet. This is not his first gig. He knows how this works. They knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because Jonah told them. Look at verse 10, very end. For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. They understood that he was trying to get away. He, they understood that he was trying to negotiate his life the way he wanted his life rather than the way God wanted his life. He chose to go by the sea, but admittedly, his God was the God of the sea. And why would you try to run? Why would, why would you do that? And that's what they don't understand. They're, they're trying to follow him. And so as the mariners, they ended up having this great fear. Notice, notice what it says there. The men, verse 10, were exceedingly afraid. Verse 5, remember? They were afraid. Verse 10, now they're exceedingly afraid. And we're going to see that come up again uh, a little bit later in the chapter about the fear that arises. But there is no escape. There is no escaping the Almighty. The mariners understood that. Jonah had to come to grips with that. And for us, we need to remember that. There is no escaping the Almighty. Wherever I go, whatever I do, God is, God is there. 
And so the mariners have this unique concern for Jonah. They, they develop a concern for him that Jonah did not have for them. Notice in verse 11, it says, They said unto him, What shall we do to thee that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea was, was wrought, it was, it was fighting against them, and it was tempestuous. And he said to them, Take me up and cast me into the sea. Throw me, throw me overboard, so shall the sea be calm unto you. What do they want more than anything? They want a calm sea. He says, you throw me overboard, then it will be calm. It will be good. So the sailors, after demanding a solution, they had to have something to appease God. They wanted to appease God's wrath. And, and so they, Jonah says, cast me into the sea. And Jonah demonstrates an understanding of God. But I think it's important for us to recognize his motives. Jonah understood that God's wrath had to be satisfied. Jonah understood that he needed to, to be thrown overboard. But were his motives noble? I, I have a hard time saying, wow, Jonah was the most noble man and saying, throw me, throw me overboard. Jonah recognizes that the storm is because of him, but he is being driven by his conscience and not by his compassion for the men. If, if it was by compassion, what should he have done? Jump overboard. Absolutely. That's what he should have done. If you're really concerned about the, then jump. Do that. Jonah's not seeking to repent here before the Lord, but he resigns himself to the only seeming solution. He looks all around. He's like, there's no other option. I'd throw, me, throw me overboard. Why did he jump? Was he too frightened? So you thought you gave a bad answer, but it was actually, a, I was going there. You know, he, was he too frightened? Was he asking the sailors to be the punishing hand of God? Possibly. You, you throw me overboard. But if he was truly motivated for the sailors' lives, I think he should have jumped. Take that step of faith and get out there. Move and do that. Jonah shows little or no concern for them. He just, he's, he's going to do that. But notice the response again of the mariners. When they're, when they're put with the, the fact that we've got to throw a person who has paid for a fare with us overboard. What do they do? It says that in verse 13, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. They did not want to throw Jonah overboard. They did not. Why did they, the men attempt to row to land? Why? It's because rather than trust the prophet, they were still trusting in their own abilities. Is that why? That's a possibility to, for them to look and say, no, we can do this. We can row ourselves to land. We, we can, we've, we've beaten storms before. We can do that. Or is it because they did not want to cast Jonah overboard? They didn't want to be guilty of throwing him overboard and causing this man's death. Obviously, God was not in favor of their attempts in dealing with the stormy situation. They thought they had a plan. They thought they could do it their way, but they did not do it the way that God was expecting. And as the prophet spoke, they were supposed to, they should have followed after that. But isn't it true? It's so human of us to choose our own way over the way that God intends. God has a way, God has a plan, and yet we often choose in our own efforts, in our own strength, to do it our way rather than following God's way. Rather than looking and saying, I'm going to do what God intends. The storm, the sea, they were against them. There was no winning. There was no way they could do this. Not on their own. It couldn't happen. There's a superficial human response. Does not work when repentance is needed. Jonah needed to repent. Jonah should have repented. That's what he should have done. Not even jumped. He should have just repented. And said, God, I'm wrong. I want to go back and I will fulfill what you wanted me to do. That's what he should have done. And our frail little attempts as humans to do things in our own power, to merit things in our own effort, are meaningless when repentance is necessary. The irony of Jonah's decision in his mind is that he will die either way. If he confesses, he will die alone in his mind. I'll go to Nineveh and I'll be put to death. If he says nothing, then everybody there will die. So God is going to reduce Jonah's decision to one simple question. It's this. Will your life and death 
be instrumental in saving lives, the lives of others? Or will you just die an ordinary death with these pagans at sea? And Jonah has to wrestle through that. Now, take that question for a second. Take out the pagans at sea. Because I don't think most of us are probably going to die with pagans at sea. Okay? Take that question and ponder it for a second in your life. Will your life and death be instrumental in saving the lives of others? Or will you just die an ordinary death? What's our life going to be about? What will it, what impact will it have in the lives of other people? Or will it just be an ordinary life? We need to be living an extraordinary life for an extraordinary God. Now you see in verses 14 through 16, I believe, you see the conversion of these mariners. You see a a heart change that occurs. As they become aware of their inability to save themselves, they resign themselves to the word of the prophet. They're going to take Jonah and they're going to chuck him overboard. They must do what God expects of them. They don't want to participate at first, but they recognize that they have to do that. They must do it. So the, another, another pagan prayer meeting breaks out. Okay? There's more pagan prayer meetings than there are the Christian prayer meetings that are occurring here. But they, they start having this, this prayer meeting, and they do it, though, with this newfound respect this newfound power of God. Notice in verse 14. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and they said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beg you, let us not perish for this man's life and don't lay upon him his, us, his innocent blood or upon us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they took Jonah, they cast him into the sea and the sea ceased from her raging. And you see them start to change. Though they respected God's power, they also feared his vengeance. They were aware that taking a man's life was a serious matter. And so they didn't want to just chuck him overboard and think everything was going to be okay, especially now that they know he's one of God's and one of God's prophets, and then he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Are we, are we going to, like, this guy, this God just sent all of this storm against us. Are we going to just simply throw his prophet overboard? They wanted to make sure that what they were doing, that they weren't going to be held held. Uh, accountable. Now, when it talks about that idea of innocent blood, what are, they, what are they talking about? Did they believe that Jonah's guilt was uncertain? Maybe, but probably not at this point. What I think they probably meant, and it fits with the wording, is that they felt as though they had been ju- uh, he had not been yet judged by a tribunal. There wasn't an official trial to condemn him to guilt. Sort of like who shot, who shot JFK? That guy, right? Yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald. But was he ever, you have to technically, you have to call him the alleged shooter. Because he never, but he, but he was the one who did it. We know he did it. And so, because he was never faced a tribunal. They did not want to be held responsible. That's what these men did not want to do. They wanted God to realize that they were unwilling pawns in this situation. They said, God, we're, we're, not, we're not wanting to do this, but we're going to need to do this. So as they cast Jonah into the sea, the sea ceased from her raging. It doesn't look like that. It, I believe it went completely calm, that the sea ceased. The ceasing of the storm was proof once again that Jonah was a prophet. It's also proof that God was the creator and the controller of the world. So now you have these these pagan men who have been trying to figure it out and all of a sudden it just all changes because they submitted to the will, the word of the prophet. They now know that they cast a prophet overboard, for sure. They now know that this God, Jehovah, was the true God. They now know that everything that has been spoken by this this Jonah is is true, that he is the creator of the land and the sea. And they, they come to grips with who who God is. They now have, verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. There is a reverence. There is a great respect and awe for him. The instant they stop putting forth effort, the instant they stop putting forth effort on their own and instead trusted in God's solution, his wrath was gone. It was was taken away. 
How true even for us. As we sit here as human beings, every single person here is facing the wrath of God. God's wrath is upon us because we are sinners. Because we have violated God's standard of holiness. Because we have lied, we have cheated, we have stolen something. We've been disrespectful to our parents. We could, we could list could go on and on and on. And because of our rebellion against God, we now stand facing the terminal wrath of God. The wrath of God coming against us. The fact that we are destined and bound for hell for all of eternity because of our sin. And yet, so many humans act like the mariners. There's an emotional response to that idea, like, oh, I don't like that. They had an emotional response where they feared God initially. They were afraid of, of everything that was happening. And then what do they try to do? They try to row. They try to lighten the load. They do everything in their power to merit God's favor, to earn God's favor, hoping that something they will do. They even try spiritual things, offering up prayers that are not good to God. They try all this different stuff, spiritual, physical, emotional. They're trying, 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 trying to earn God's favor. And yet the only thing that will satisfy God's wrath is what God says. And God has clearly said that because we are sinners, we deserve death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That salvation from that wrath that is upon us is only through Jesus Christ. It's not through the good things you do. It's not through the efforts that you strive for. But to know that God is here and he has given you the opportunity to accept his gift of salvation to admit you're a sinner and to believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins and your sins alone. Because that is the gift that God gave to us. And I would beg and I would plead, if there's someone here today, you are not certain you're on your way to heaven, that at the end of our service, you would come talk. We would love to show you how you can know that that wrath that is coming against you can be put aside because of the free gift of Jesus Christ on the cross. The mariners feared death, they feared death, and they feared God. They feared him greatly. And what's interesting to me is the fear in their lives turned to submissive awe, which manifested itself in some degree of repentance. To ask for forgiveness, to, say, to turn from their ways and to change. To ask Christ to forgive them. Well, they ask, they ask God to forgive them. We ask Christ to forgive us. In the process, they, in their own attempts, both spiritually and physically, to grow in in safety. We talked about that. What's, what's cool is at the very end, what do they do? I, cool is probably just the, not even a good word for it because it's, it's more amazing than that. The men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. The sacrifice is a public expression of dependence and worship. They offered their sacrifices to God. Do we, as we come into the reverence and the awe of God, when we come here and we offer our sacrifices of praise, we offer our sacrifices of giving, we offer our sacrifices of prayer, do we come with the awe and the respect and the wonder of God? And then they offer him vows. A vow is a public expression with the intent to continual faithful worship. Not running, but saying, I'm coming to worship our great God, to give of our lives, to give of our time, to give of our energy to God. And whatever way you're able to do that, a little bit better this week than you did last because of who God is, because he is the Almighty. He is pursuing us even when we're rebelling, even though that's our natural tendency. He is coming before us, coming and longing for us, to live the life that he has put forward for us. Now some question the sincerity of these vows. Some question them. But I, I remind you, what did these men just see happen to somebody who went away, went against this Lord? They just saw, and remember, we all, we all have an advantage here. 
we know what's happening to Jonah, right? For the most part. When they threw him over, what did they just do? They sentenced him to death. They have no, they, those, those sailors never know. As far as we know, they never know that that guy lives. They just did what God told them to do. They followed through. And so as I look at it, I say, okay, what are some final thoughts for us to just take away from this, this accounting in the first chapter? Every person has an inclination. We do. We have to be aware of it. We have an inclination to flee from God's leading. But God pursues the prodigal even today. You may say, I'm so far away from God. I used to do the God thing when I was young, and now I'm so far. God still pursues you. You say, well, I have just, this has not been, God still pursues, God is gracious, God is merciful, God desires to forgive you. In Christ, God offers an enduring call to repentance and reconciliation. He is constantly begging. If you're not saved, he's begging you to come and to be reconciled with him. If you are saved and you are far from God, he's begging for you to repent, for you to be reconciled, to be made right with him. God still calls believers today to the risky task of proclaiming repentance and forgiveness. He is moving, he is begging for us to do this, to, to share the gospel, to do it, to step out by faith and to share. We, must not we may not be physically running, but do you find yourself negotiating your participation in the gospel? You might say, well, I'm still here. I'm, I'm still all about the gospel. I'm just going to let someone else do it. I'll just, I'll, I'll just you know, resign myself to one little thing, or I'll, I'll make sure I give money for missions, and that's my part of the gospel. God calls all of us to be disciple makers. God calls all of us as believers to be sharing the gospel. It is not only for a few people. It's not a, I give my tithes so that Pastor Kim can go out and do all the evangelism. That's not, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we are to be part. We don't negotiate our, our way with the gospel. And then last, we often believe God's calling for our life, but we just don't want to obey it. I think when we look at Jonah, Jonah knew better than anybody else in that group about God's call. And yet he says, I'm not going to. I ask you, what is it this week what is it today that God is telling you, hey, you haven't been obeying me in this. I've called you to do X, Y, Z. And are you doing it? Questions to ask us, questions to consider. But let's, let's, before we give Jonah a really hard time, and as we continue to study the book, let's look internally and say, am I more like Jonah than I want to admit? So many times for me, that's the case. Let's look at the constants and say, let's keep those constants focused and let's move forward in life because God is pursuing us and God desires for us to get right back on track so father God I pray that you would help us as we continue to study through this book to understand your truths to understand what you have for us and God we thank you for the time that we can have to study in your name we pray amen